Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley with Variety. Before we're joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation today is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given nearly $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. So if you are a SAG after artist and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Jessica Chastain. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you. It's so good to be here. I wish we were in person again. I, I wish know. we were in person. But soon, soon. Welcome to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is an audience of your fellow SAG after actors. So I actually always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Uh, probably by uh, the way a lot of people got their SAG card, it was ER. So I was stoked. I got a guest spot on ER. Um, and uh, I played this young, this teenager who was, you know, torturing her comatose father uh, to make up um, or to get him back for abusing her as a child. So, you know, light stuff. But I graduated from college and um, it was my first job out of college. So I was, I was very excited. When you said it was probably the, the way a lot of people got it, my guesses were ER or Law and Order. And you've done exactly. both. Exactly. I did. I So I actually, I was a recurring character on Law and Order Trial by Jury which is the BB Newworth um, one in New York. So that was pretty, I played like uh, assistant district attorney, Sigrun Borg. <laughs> Where did that name come from? I don't know. I don't know. I, that again, it was supposed to be like a one episode thing. And they're like, hey, we're going to refer you. Wow. Which again, I was stoked, but then the show didn't last. Yeah. Well, you're doing okay now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> That's about you just landed your third Oscar nomination and fourth SAG Award nomination for your role in the eyes of Tammy Faye. Um, we're going to get into that in depth, but first I actually want to go back to the beginning and just sort of ask, when did you first develop an interest in, in performing? Were you someone who did school plays? Did you always know this was what you wanted to do? Yeah, always. I mean, I, I came from a, not a, like a, not a, the most stable situation. And, um, my, you know, my mom had me quite young. So it was a lot of, uh, it was just kind of just trying to figure out how the world worked. And my grandmother, um, I think she noticed that I was a kid that needed some kind of outlet. Um, and I was very expressive. I remember like, you know, in the report cards, what the teachers would say, I would get like high ranks for imagination, but like low ranks for pay att paying attention. <laughs> so I was just like, kind of like looking at the clouds or whatever. I was just, I wanted to be very creative and I needed an outlet for that. So she took me to go see Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I think I was like seven or eight years old. And it was a big deal because it was a professional. It was like the music circus theater in Sacramento. And she said, this is, you know, this is a, a big deal because these are professional actors. And I didn't really know what that meant to be a professional actor. But I just thought, okay, it's, you know, this is what they get paid to do. And the lights came on and there was a little girl on stage narrating and she like opened a book and she started. And immediately I was like, this is what you get to do for a job. And I, it wasn't a moment of like, oh, this is what I want to be when I grow up. It just was an immediate like, recognition of this is what I am. Oh, this is what I am. This is what I do. And it, so it, in some sense, it was quite, it was any, there was no anxiety because yeah. no matter what, no matter if I was like making $300 a week, you know, working in regional theater somewhere, which was one of my first jobs. And I was very excited by, or the career that I have now, which I never really imagined could be possible. I just knew that's what I was. And that's what I was going to be happy doing. Did you know how to get there, though, from, you know, living in Sacramento to I mean, you knew enough to apply to Juilliard. So, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, you know, I would go to my mom and I'd be like, hey, mom, can you please take me to L.A. to audition for commercials? Because I didn't know, you know, what to do. And I would say that and she would kind of be like, but we didn't know agents. We didn't know anyone. 
And then there was one point I started dancing at this place called Broadway Academy, where the owner, Dave McDonald, again, he was so like, it's all about people who just take care of you because I got for year one Christmas, uh, I got to do a play there, like a musical there. And he came up to me and he said, Hey, I think, you know, you're really good. And, and I think you need to be studying here. And I was just honest. I was like, we don't have any money. Like I can't take classes here, but thank you. <laughs> I probably, probably was like 12. And so he said, okay, come with me. And he goes, what I'm going to do. And he gave me like this four classes for free card. And he said, here's four classes. You can take whatever you want. Uh, if you want to take any more than that, you can work study here. So you work an hour and a half in the office and you get one hour class. And so that's what I did. And that was amazing. And through there, I had another moment where like a talent scout came through and went to my mom and said, hey, we'd like to bring Jessica to New York to audition. Maybe it was for pilot season or what. But again, it cost it. It wasn't free. It was like, you know, we need to fly to New York and we weren't a family that could do that. So you, you couldn't do that. No. So even like if people were like, you know, your daughter's got talent or you know, like that little <laughs> old fashioned idea of what that is. It really, we just didn't have the means to support it. And when I got to Juilliard, it was more like I was, um, I was acting in a regional theater company and I was doing uh, a Romeo and Juliet at Theater Works in Palo Alto. I was playing I Juliet. And, works. Yeah. yeah that's so what I, yeah. Oh, you have? Yeah. Well, hey, it was a big deal for me because I was playing Juliet there and we like, it was, we did it their theater and then we did it at Mountain View and the guy was playing Romeo got into Juilliard and I was like, huh, I think we're kind of similar. And in terms of like skills, you know, Romeo and Juliet, let me audition. And I auditioned and I got in wow. and that changed my life. And I believe you got in on a scholarship, I think from Robin Williams. Yeah. So I got a Robin Williams, the Robin Williams scholarship who he's an alumni there. And it was amazing. I mean, in the beginning, of course, it was a lot of loans uh, and there's no way I would have been able to go without the financial aid and like grants um, because, you know, the cost of the dorm, the cost of the food, the, you know, traveling there, the, the tuition, it was so massive and, uh, and sh just shocking compared to like my family, like what we could do. And and then when I got the Robin Williams scholarship, it paid for everything, not just tuition and books and all that. And, and like it paid for housing. It paid for me to go home for Christmas to see my family. It um, it was huge uh, in that like the support all of a sudden I, I could breathe this huge sigh of relief um, because of his generosity. Were you ever able to meet him and thank him? I wrote him a letter. Oh. Um you know, and, you know, to say like how grateful I was, cause he's also from Northern California right? and yeah. And there's like the legend of Robin Williams, you know, you always hope to meet him. And then I was at a restaurant after I graduated in Los Angeles, I think I had a meeting with someone and I told, I told him the story about the Robin Williams scholarship and he said, you know, wow, that was great. And then Robin Williams walks into the restaurant and I was like, Oh my God. And the director was like, now's your chance. And it was like, it was so sweet. We were, I was meeting on this film. It was this tiny, tiny little film. Because now's your chance. Go say hi. I was like, okay. And I looked and he was like just eating. And I was like, oh, I don't want to go and interrupt him in the middle of yeah. his meal. So I'm going to wait till like they take this food away. So I was in my meeting and then I was like looking at him. And then he must have been late for something because all of a sudden in the middle of the meal, he just stood up and like quickly walked out of the restaurant. And then I stood up like, well, I'm going to chase him. And I... I didn't, but that's a big regret I have. I wish I had chased him. So mm -hmm. if anyone listening to this, if you see me at a restaurant, walk out, it, you chase me, chase me <laughs> and come say hi. Because you are opening the doors I'm with opening, that statement. <laughs> I'm very, I'm super happy whenever I meet someone. So it, I should have done it. I was too shy. I was too scared. I didn't want to you know, bother anyone. You're not bothering me. Anyone who, uh, listening, you're not bothering me. Come say hi. Uh, I know you were a, group, a member of Group 32 at Juilliard, yeah. and I know people have very different experiences there. What was your time like? And, and did you, did they sort of, I, I hesitate to use the word method, but you had training going in, but yeah. I'm imagining it was nothing like training at Juilliard. Yeah, but I mean, my training going in was more of like, 
okay, let me read Udo Hagen's book. I was kind of like any kind of acting book I would read or I watched, I got my hands on Michael Caine's acting on camera, which was amazing. Um, so I had done all of that kind of stuff. What could I do on my own? But when I got to the Juilliard, it was like, it was so different. I mean, I got to work with John Sticks, who he was a, a member of the acting studio, the actor studio with like Marilyn Monroe and Brand, like when all of the, them were there uh, together. Um, and he taught us a lot about sense memory. He taught a lot about substitution. That was very much the, like the Strasberg, Stanislavski, like that kind of immersive method um, training. Second year, I worked with Eve Shapiro and sh she was more, I felt like that was more of like an Uta Hagen um, training. And then it just kind of, you know, we just, we worked with so many different teachers. There was never like, this is the way to do it. You know, they, it was kind of like, what do you, what works for you? What, how, what, how, what makes you give the most authentic performance without hurting someone else do that? Um, and so they, they taught us everything. What does work for you or does it change from role to role? Or do, do you have like a, a general way you approach a, a part? The, the thing that I, that works for me that I found to be the only consistent thing through every project um, is the play or is the script. Mm. So for me, the most important information you're going to find is written in the script. Uh, so I, I do the things of like, okay, I, I write everything out. Like what's my name? How old am I? When was I born? What were my parents' names? What's my favorite color? What do I smell like? All of these things I want to know the answer to, even if I'm not playing a real person like Tammy Faye, if I'm creating a character like Lucille Sharp in, um, in uh, Crimson Peak, I still have to answer those questions um, and base them on material I get in the script. So for me, there's a lot of work, um, I guess you could say book work, you know, like, or writing down almost like journal entries. Um, but also as I'm doing it, I wear the perfume of the character I'm studying because then when I get on set and I put it back on, it all comes back. So there's a lot of prep before I get on set. And then once I'm on set, I don't think about it at all. Wow. I don't think nothing because it's there. So you, once I'm on set, the most important thing is just to be um, in the moment and to really focus on whoever you're acting with. Uh, you can't show up and be like, I know how I'm going to play this scene. Or I'm, it's, for me, it's all about uh, my scene partner. Uh, do you still have Lucille Sharp's journals? Because I would actually like to read those. <laughs> oh my God. They're pretty dark stuff. I mean, the things that happened to her in that mental hospital whoo, before that, before our thing starts, it's pretty dark. Wow. So yeah, I, I had to justify how she got to where, um, where she is when we meet her. Right. Cause she's not a nice person. No, <laughs> no. But then again, as an ad, you can't judge. Right. So right. No, she's a serial killer. Um, I had to go like, okay, well, I read a book about female serial killers. And the thing that I responded to that made it emotional for me is that the author was saying female serial killers are so dangerous and so scary because they don't kill to cover something up. They kill because of the way it makes them feel. Oh, wow. Whereas a lot of men, they cover up an, an act with murder yeah. and, and female serial killers murder makes them feel power. Wow. So that to me was like, oh, for someone who doesn't have any power that I'm sure that can be quite um, strong that that pulled that. So you have to kind of like, also you have to go, okay, well, how can I find my way in to a person that I fundamentally disagree with on every level? <laughs> well, and obviously no one's born a serial killer, you know, yeah. some, she had a terrible life that that yeah. led her to that so um so I know upon graduation you moved to LA and it, it always looks easier from the outside but it's it, it looks like you started working fairly quickly did, did it feel that way to you or did it take a while um, well it took a while because I couldn't get audi an audition for a film for years I mean I um I moved to LA after I graduated uh college and I what was the amazing thing is I got a deal with John Wells. So cool. that was amazing because what it did is it changed my life. It um, I got paid to audition for his shows. Um, that's 
when I did ER, that it was on a John Wells show. I auditioned for a character on the West Wing. They had anticipated, I think when they gave me that deal, they saw the character in one way. And they and that was kind of like was gonna happen for me. And then as they were writing the character, she became something completely different. So I no longer fit in that. Um but it was okay again because I've now I have money to to be in LA. Um, I got to do I got to travel back and forth. They would fly me back and forth to New York to do plays um, if if they weren't going to use me in their shows. So it was it was monumental. I got that money to I stretched that money for four years. Wow! Uh, I lived with my grandmother. We got an apartment together. I went there last year. It was a it's a rent controlled building and. I think it was, it's on fourth in California in Santa Monica and the side of the buildings like falling and I had like mice everywhere in my apartment <laughs> and you know, those kind of slatted glass windows that you can easily break into. And I went there last year, you know, with, um, my family, with my, my husband and, and my kid. And, and he's like, and I stood outside the front door and he took a picture and it was like, wow, it's crazy. How did you get on John Wells's radar? Uh, well, we're the first class at Juilliard to do an LA showcase. And I did a scene from tape and basically the scene, it's very, it's a very kind of like, you know, West wingy type writing where it's a woman, she's a lawyer and she's talking to, um, this guy she went to school with. Um, and he, he's apologizing for assaulting her when they went to school. And she's like, you didn't assault me, but she's messing with him. So it's quite um, layered, uh, the scene and the writing and the dynamics of it and really intelligent. And I did that scene at our showcase and John Levy, who was John Wells casting director came and saw it. And then they invited me to Los Angeles to meet John Wells and the whole writer's room for the West Wing. And I did that. I read that scene in the room and then I got the, the holding deal. That's amazing. Yeah. How, how were you and how are you? I don't know if you still audition, but um, it's such an interesting process and it, it's it's so different from actually acting. Were you always good at it? I, you know, I don't think I was good at auditioning at all. Um, I have, I have a lot of, um, I've gotten better, but I had a lot of insecurities and like confidence issues um, when I was younger. And my voice would always pitch really high when I would get into an audition room. And um, who really changed me on that is, is Al Pacino is, you know, I got cast in Salome and we were doing a play together that he directed. It was my big break. And he put, he gave me so much confidence. Um, the way that he would like talk about me as an artist the way he talked about my choices, the way he saw me as an equal, which is an insane thing to say even now, but he treated me as an equal to him. He helped me see myself in diff through different eyes. And um, it's a complicated thing because, you you know, whenever I'm talking to, to, to actors who are like, what can you do in auditions? To, and, you know, it's like, own the room, get in there, use that space as your rehearsal that's an easy thing to say to someone, be confident. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, and so you really, you almost have to, I find sometimes, sometimes people who may not be super nice <laughs> do really well at auditions because they don't care what other people think. Right. <laughs> they come in there and they're like, F you, F you, I'm going to do it. Okay, here. And then they're like amazing because they're just taking over all the space. Um, but it took me a long time to understand that people wanted to offer me some space to be creative and to collaborate. Did you ever have any of those like nightmare auditions or was it, was it always a pretty friendly room? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had one with, uh, I had one with, um, a movie star and it was, I don't think they do these auditions anymore, but it was like a chemistry reading which is a, basically, it's a weird thing because you're going and you're like, who knows how many auditions that they're doing with all these actresses and there's like kissing and like, you know, it's just, and they're testing the chemistry. It's just such a strange thing. And, um, and I think it was at like 
Beverly Hills Hotel bungalows is like where they had the audition too. Like it was just nowadays it would never happen. Um, but the, the, the guy that I was auditioning with was not very nice. I just found him to be very rude. And um, the director was really great and very nice. And I auditioned for him a couple of times and he brought me in to meet the actor and also the producers. And it was like the screen test, but I found the actor to be not great. And so at this point I was like, you know what? I, I really don't feel that there's any chemistry. <laughs> so I, at that point I like, was like, I'm not going to kiss him. I just really, I, I just wanted to get out of the room. And I mean, I had been, I had done tree of life by then. So I felt some, and Salome, I felt like I don't need this job. I don't need to like, if I don't want to kiss this person who's, who I don't think is a nice person, I'm not going to, I'm out. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Actually, I want to talk about Salome, but first I want to talk about uh, the first time I remember seeing you on stage was in the cherry orchard at Williamsburg. Yes. Williamstown. Yes. Williams, Williams, what is Williamsburg? <laughs> well, it's <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> if there is a Williamsburg, I didn't make that up. Yeah. Okay, Williamsburg okay, in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Williamstown is very different. Yeah. Um, and it's you and Michelle Williams and uh, Chris Messina. Uh, Richie had- Costa, Linda Eamon. The cast was insane. Yeah. yeah. Crazy cast. That had to be, I know Salome really opened a lot of doors for you, but I, I'm so curious about that experience and, you know, mm-hmm. booking that role. Uh, and I know you'd done theater before, but I have to imagine that was a whole other level. Oh yeah. That was really exciting. I think that was, that was before I did Salome actually. Oh. I um, auditioned for Michael Greif for a play in uh, New York and then I couldn't do it because I think I might have been doing something for John Wells. And he remembered me. And so this was one of the first jobs where all of a sudden my agent called and said, hey, you have an offer uh, for the cherry orchard in Williamstown. I was like, what? <laughs> it was amazing. And um, yeah, it was a very special time. I mean, Michelle and I uh, became very close. We were like sisters. We shared a house together. Um, it was a three week rehearsal process. Uh, and we were the last production before the theater was torn down and, and, and the new one was built. So yeah, it was, it was very, very special. What do you like about the medium of theater versus film or TV? It's, I, you know, I'm working with Michael Shannon right now. We talk about this a lot because he's like such a theater animal. I mean, he's just an acting animal. He can like do anything. I get really nervous for the, in theater and I get, I know I'm supposed to be like, oh yeah, it's fine now. It's still really, it, it feels really scary to me. And it probably in the same way it felt when I was walking into an audition room. I, I'm, I have to fight the sense of like, oh, do they really want to see me? Or like, you know, the sense of like, do I really belong? I've, it's, I, I'm always fighting that even in theater. And I usually will have my dresser kind of like as a symbolic thing, kind of like push me onto the stage. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, but for film and, and TV, I don't feel that. Mm. The only time I was ever super nervous was um, was Tammy, and I and I and that was was interesting to me because for theater, I get to the point where it's like I'm I have my stomach hurts. You know, I like dread going to the theater at night. It's like, you know, the idea that you could go on stage and just forget everything. Um, and get lost in your head and then think, I don't know what to do. Uh, that is a very, very scary thing. Has that happened? It's never happened to me. It did happen um, one time I was on stage with another actor Oof. who is an amazing actor and uh, they went up and they kept saying, "I'm." and it was just the two of us and it was a huge house, it was Broadway. Uh, and they kept saying, I'm sorry, my darling or my dear. I, was like, uh, I don't know how to get through this scene because there was, you know, they were supposed to instigate something with me. Right. Um, and someone came on and offered water. And I was like, do you need to see a doctor? I was trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then the woman who came on, she left. And then the person that I was acting with walked off stage and I was on stage by myself. <laughs> I'm like, am I supposed to do a monologue? What's happening here? <laughs> and then slowly the curtain started coming down. <laughs> Yes. And then of course, everyone in the audience was like, <laughs> so yes, I've been there when it's happened. And that was terrifying um, because I was like, how can I help? 
Uh, but yeah, it, it hasn't, it hasn't happened to me yet, but I think it happens to everyone. Cherry Jones told me it happened to her and she had, she walked on stage with, with the script for doubt because she went up one night and she's like, I can't remember it. And so she went and got the script and just carried it for the whole show. So it's a normal thing. If anyone's like uh, terrified of it, I guess. What did they do in that case? Did you reset the scene and bring the curtain back up or? Well, yeah, the curtain went down. I was terrified because I was worried for this person that I loved very much. I was like, is something happening medically, you know? Um, And then the stage manager was there and we were all there trying to figure out what to do and said, okay, like, let's just try to run the lines. That's what the stage manager said. And I was looking at the stage manager, like, please don't send me, don't send us back out there because this, that was terrifying. And the person I was with couldn't really remember the lines. Also, I think they were rattled. Of course. It was, you know, was, he, so he needed to walk away. Um, and so they, they, it was that for a few minutes. And then the stage manager said, okay, why don't you go home or maybe go to see a doctor? Cause we need to make sure you're okay. And then they made an announcement. The part of da, 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 will now be played by, and of course the audience lost it. It was like, they were, it was so dramatic what was happening. Wow. And then we started at the top of the scene with the new actor that I had never, it was the understudy I'd never acted with. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I remember one time your dog joined you on stage. <laughs> yes, I know. I feel so bad, but um, little Chaplin. Um, it was like 2012 and uh, Chaplin was in my dressing room and he's got three legs. And so I can hear me because he hops, you know, and he walks and everyone knows there's a sign on the door. Please don't open the door. And on two show days, like I can't, go back and forth so I have to bring him with me uh and I was on stage for a very dramatic scene and I heard the jingle of his collar and I was like oh no he's coming here he comes he's coming and then I heard boing 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 I was like okay and then it stopped and I heard the audience go like that I thought all right he's on stage with me he's probably like right next to me like I found you and so then I just like walked off stage and he like you know, hopped off yeah. stage and I, I picked him up and handed him to someone. I said, please put him up in my dressing room. And then, uh, I mean, the audience loved it though. Yeah, I course. mean, they love moments like that. And I, and I brought him out for curtain call and everyone was really excited. <laughs> His Broadway debut. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so to go back to Salome, um, how did Al Pacino, who I know you've said has been a huge influence on your life and career, how did you sort of come to his attention? I did a play at Playwrights Horizons um, called Rodney's Wife, written by Richard Nelson um, with David Strathairn, who's like, oh, I, love, I love that man. He's such a brilliant actor. Um, he played my dad. And, you know, it was like I, I, I was ex- really excited to do it. Not that many people really saw it. Went on with my life in L.A. auditioning for things. And I was visiting Michelle Williams in uh, Australia. Michelle and Keith, I was, you know, I was there for about three weeks and I got an email that said Al Pacino is doing Salome and he's going to do the play and then he wants to make a movie of it and would like you to come in and audition. I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me. How is that possible? Uh, And then, but I read the play and I realized, well, this really doesn't make sense because Salome is a great part and I never met him and I haven't really had a moment that anyone would think that I could be acting opposite him. So what, how is this happening? I went to the actor's studio. I met Estelle Parsons first. Wow. And she's, she's really, um, I mean, talk about abroad. I mean, she's really like out there because the part of Salome, it's, it's not an easy part to play. You can't be shy. You know, you're doing this dance of the seven veils. You're most likely if you're comfortable going to do nudity. There's a lot about it that um, is tough. And so I met her and one of the first things she said, she, does, she doesn't cut to the chase. She's just like, okay, tell me, why should I know you? Like, I don't know why you should know me. I've done this, I've done this, I've done some theater. We talked a little bit. She didn't have me read yet. And I was like thinking like, okay, am I gonna read anything? And then she goes, all right, let me see a dance. I'm like, what? You wanna see me dance? She's like, yeah, I wanna see the way you move. And we're in this room and I was like, this is so awkward. And I get really embarrassed very easily, but I wanted that part. And I was like, "Mm." and also I think it, cause it was a spell parsons. I was like, I'm tough. You're tough, but I'm tough too. I can, I can pretend to be tough. 
so I, I was like, all right. And I got, I walked over there, like, and I just started with no music, started like dancing. Like I thought Salome may dance <laughs> with a cell person, just like watching me. And afterwards she goes, okay. And then they called me back to audition for Al Pacino. Wow. That's and amazing. I found out it was Marta Keller who saw me in Playwrights Horizons, uh, Rodney's wife. And she had done a movie with Al and was good friends with him. And so she, um, you know, you never know what, what job is going to get another job. She had said to him, you should see this young New York theater actress. Um, she should audition. I remember the play was done uh, in Brentwood in Los Angeles and yeah. like everybody went and it, it's a huge theater. Um, I'm going to guess that that was a real boost for your career. Probably a lot of people saw you in that. Oh yeah. I mean, before that, I wasn't really getting film auditions. I was, pilot season was big. And I was like memorizing 20 pages a day and like drive. I was living out of my car where it's like, you have all these costumes in your trunk and doing your makeup and like going from, I remember I, I tested with Amy Adams for Dark Shadows, different parts, different, you know, parts in the series. But I remember like, there's so many women and great actresses that our paths have cro crossed on pilot season. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I did something like that, but I could not get a film audition. I just couldn't break through. No one really cared, you know, about theater, to be honest, or that I went to Juilliard or anything. It was just kind of also when they first met me, I wasn't, I felt awkward. I did what, you know, I just, it did, I guess I just didn't scream Starlet. I don't know what I have not. Uh, and then, when I got Salome, all of a sudden, I'm acting opposite. I'm I'm the title character in an Al Pacino play um, in mm. Los Angeles, which is not even New York. It's like theater is now coming to L.A., and I'm an unknown who's playing something that I'm actually of all I'd always been very uncomfortable with. I'm playing this femme fatale, so I'm having to be ultra confident and feel sexy. Uh, and I had, that had always been something that was like the hardest thing, I think, for me to walk into a room owning. But now here I am on stage and all these casting directors and directors and people in the in industry are like, oh, you know, maybe let's bring this girl in. That's, and so I know I actually correct me if I'm wrong, but the first film you made was Jolene. Yes. It was an eight, but it was a couple of years before it was released. Mm -hmm. And then you shot the films, uh, well, you shot The Debt, Take Shelter, and Tree of Life, but it, it just, it felt like- Take Shelter was after Tree of Life. It was after Tree of Life. Okay. I, I mean, like, you were sort of this big secret in the industry that people knew about, and we were all just sort of waiting to explode, even though the movies hadn't come out yet. Was that time exciting, or was it kind of frustrating, or maybe both? Both, I guess. But looking back on it now, it was such a gift. Um, I think what made it frustrating is it was still hard to get auditions. I mean, I could be seen, but no one had really seen my work. So to cast me in a film opposite Brad Pitt, which I ended up doing with Tree of Life, you know, that wouldn't be an easy thing to do um, until people saw work. I mean, I did the first thing, film I did was Jolene and that happened right after Salome. I performed Salome in uh, LA. It was immediate kind of like, and then it's like the lead character of this film who goes through all this stuff. And then I, I think right after that, I got the audition and it wasn't because of Jolene. It wasn't because of Salome, but I think because casting directors all of a sudden started paying attention, I, I was getting brought in for stuff and I got it brought in for Tree of Life. Wow. And when it when when that was like starting to look like oh this is getting close I do know that Al Pacino wrote um, Terry a letter um, saying listen you know I know she hasn't worked much but you know she'll she'll do what you need her to do uh, in terms of performance so it was it was great and correct me if I'm wrong but I think there was originally another actor in Tree of Life and when they it was cast yeah no it was going to be Heath Ledger. Oh, so right. I, who I was friends with, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not like I was more friends with Michelle, but I'd stayed with them. And um, I, yeah. So Heath and I had a rehearsal together actually over, I think it was like Thanksgiving break. Um, but that was a few months also before he passed away. 
uh, and then Brad um, came in and uh, replaced Heath. Was there ever any question when when Brad came in that the role might go to someone else? Yes. <laughs> I mean, already I was like, is this, am I going to get away with this? Like even like being in this, the lead of this film with Heath Led, am I going to get, is this, okay, this looks like it's happening great. And then um, Terry, you know, when he said, okay, he's not going to do the part anymore because he actually, before um, Heath passed, you know, I think Terry was like, this is, we, I think we need to replace him. Um, I thought, okay, what's going to happen? I don't, I really don't know. I didn't, didn't know the actors that they, he was even talking to. And when he said it was going to be Brad Pitt, Brad at that point was like the biggest movie star working. And I just thought, oh, there's no way Brad's going to be okay with acting opposite someone who's never really done anything. And I'm about to get fired. <laughs> but I didn't. <gasps> Brad was so cool and so yeah. warm and so nice and supportive and and everyone really like everyone like held out for me i mean my hair was falling out from nerves <laughs> really? yeah i was scared i was really scared well something everybody saw when it came out was the help for which you received your first oscar nomination um celia foot is actually my favorite character in the whole book um, oh, me too actually i love celia foot I love that character. Obviously a big turning point in your career, but also you're working alongside people like Octavia Spencer and Viola Davis, who you still, I believe, are friends with and work with yeah. to this day. What was yeah. that experience like? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, when that when that script first got sent to me, uh, my reps initially saw uh, me playing, you know, they thought I'd read for the lead, you know, the Emma, Emma Stone character. And I read and I go, actually, I really like Celia Foote. You know, I do not look like Celia Foot at all. And so they were like, okay, we'll tell them you want to read for that. And I went in and, you know, I I read with Octavia Spencer. It's the first time we met. And I didn't have the voice yet. I didn't, I didn't, you know, you, you know, when she talks like this, I I I didn't know that voice yet. I I think I spoke probably more like the Jolene character um at that time, uh at that audition. And but I kind of the heart, everything I felt about Celia, I, I kind of felt from the beginning. And I we read Octavia and I read the scene together. And then when it ended, she looked at me and she goes, I love you. And I said, I love you. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just loved her. And uh, it was, it was kind of, it's the first time I've really had love at first sight like that, where I knew everything was going to be okay, because I was acting with Octavia. Uh, I know, like, it's it's obvious to me, but why do you think you were so drawn to Celia? Um, I think I was drawn, I'm drawn to, like, what's underneath a facade, you know? I like playing multiple things at once, and, and maybe that's why, too, I think a lot of people assume I'm super confident, type A, you know, this, like, this uh, force and all, and the reality is I'm quite the opposite of it. Like, I don't even like to have a birthday party. I get really shy. I get nervous people looking at me. I'm very, I would, that's why I was not good at auditioning. I'm I get quite anxious, but I fight that by, by being caught by like forcing myself through it. And with Celia, you look at her and she's like, has, you think like, Oh, the whole world is, is at her fingertips. And she's so bubbly, like her favorite character is Marilyn Monroe. Like she, you know, says that in the book, like all of these things about her. And then you realize, oh, she, there's actually a lot of sadness, especially this idea of like, is she a woman enough because she's having trouble having children? Is she going to be thrown away? I mean, she, she's from Sugar Ditch. It was called Sugar Ditch because it was a ditch of sewage. And she like really came from the wrong side of the tracks. And now she's living in this house with this man she loves and life is so beautiful. And is she going to be discarded? And why don't people love her? Um, that to me, like the sadness of like wanting to love and wanting to like be loved. Uh, I just, I, I just adored the character um, for her desire to connect to others. Uh, I believe you told me a story about uh, the night of the Oscars. You're nominated for the help. You go, you party. And then the next day you had to get on a plane to go do Zero Dark Thirty. Yes. Wow. Yes. 
I know, which is crazy. I mean, it was like that the whole time though, because I was in, um, I mean, we actually talked about maybe me missing the Oscars um, because I know I was so excited to do Zero Dark Thirty. And, uh, and Catherine was the one, she's like, you cannot miss the Oscars. Oh, I didn't want to. I literally, I like really didn't want to, but I was also, I didn't want to let anyone down. And I also wanted to play this part. So working with someone like Catherine, she understood how important it was, especially as you're like a first time nominee. And it's one of the most exciting moments of your life. And, and she made sure that I, I got to be there. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously such a complicated character, such, uh, you know, I, I hate to use the word heavy, but it's heavy material. Yeah. Where did you even begin with Maya? Uh, well, I had to learn a lot about the war on terror. I had to learn a lot about, like, I read The Looming Towers. I read Michael Schur's book on Osama bin Laden, which was shockingly enlightening because it went way beyond the stereotype that sometimes we get from media. And you realize, like, what actually made him such an opponent for this woman is he was steadfast. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a hypocrite in terms of his beliefs. He was you know, faith-based and steadfast in it. And even when he was a child. So when you read about it, you kind of like, there is that, un you start to understand the man. And I guess that's also it. Like if you're playing a character who is trying to capture someone, whether it be a detective who's trying to solve a case or whatever, you have to really understand the person you're trying to find or capture or whatever. And so I started in that aspect. I was like, I need to kind of, understand what this all means and why he's doing why he's doing what he's what he's done why he did what he did uh I started there and then talking to the real woman you did talk to her oh yeah okay oh, yeah and and we're friends to this day oh wow that's amazing I mean I I could be wrong but I think at least on film this was your first time portraying a real person which you would obviously do again with Molly's game and Zookeeper's wife um did you feel an extra responsibility? Did it change your approach to the material or how you prepared? I did. I felt a huge responsibility um, in playing her. Uh, but I, but also, you know, my brothers in the military, there's all, you know, I live in New York. I was in New York when 9-11 happened. Doing Zero Dark Thirty, it was just, it just felt heavy. Yeah. You know, there was a moment I was on set. I, and this has never happened to me before. I like had a, like a panic attack in the middle of some prison in, in Jordan. And I like went behind a building and was just like sobbing and Jason Clark's there trying to like calm me down. It was just very, very heavy. The material we were doing all of the scenes, the interrogation scenes. I, I put like, you know, all the, the most wanted for the CIA. I like had pictures of them and I put them up in my hotel room. I, I wasn't in a, point in this part of my life also I, I wasn't in a relationship I didn't really have a family I'm by myself doing all of this and I just let it take over me and it was dark <laughs> when you're working on material like that um, but it felt right for the responsibility of the story we were telling have you learned to sort of navigate that now uh, maybe a little better when you have to play you know a really intense role or do you still sort of lose yourself I always lose myself. So now what I've had to do is I have to be more selective. And there's been situations where like I was having, um, without getting too personal, but I was like having a moment where I needed my personal life to kind of be different. And I was having kind of health issues and, and all this stuff. And I was going to do this one movie. And I knew by playing this part, it was not going to help my personal life and that it would create more angst in my body. It would create all of this. And I've, I've had moments where I've like spoken to the director and said, you know, I I'm afraid that if I do this, it's going to create the X, Y, and Z in me. Um, I can, I'm not method. Like I'm not like call me by the character's name, but it's the same thing of like laughing therapy. You know, when you're depressed and people say, okay, laugh, you have to laugh for 15 minutes every day. It changes your chemistry. Like there's things you do change your chemistry. If I'm doing something 
dark, it changes my chemistry. It just does it. If I'm doing something joyful, it changes my chemistry. And I need to be aware of that, especially with the people that I'm around day to day. What am I bringing home? And, you know, if I, if it's, if it's going to be intense, I need, I need also a moment to like, let it go. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I know it's acting, but I don't know that your body always knows the difference when you're putting it through trauma. (laughs) No, putting it through anything. I mean, but that's the kind of the beautiful thing also. It's like, playing Celia Foote was so joyful and so loving. And I was so happy all the time. Um, And yes, there's sadness. There was a terrible, terrible things that were happening to her, to her body. Um, But there was a lot of joy there. So yeah, you feel, I mean, for me, when I'm, when I'm acting, I, I, I'm never like, I'm acting. Like I, I always, it's just, it becomes real in the same way that when little kids are playing, like aliens or whatever they're playing. It's so committed. It's real. They're really in it. As soon as I'm on set and I'm in costume, it's, it's the, the best joy for me is it feels like I'm, I've walked into someone else's body and it feels, and it becomes real. I'm curious because with the eyes of Tammy Faye, she obviously goes through a lot, but she also, and you know, uh, she has an addiction, but she also seems in so many ways, a loving, joyous character. Yeah. You know, did you like being in her skin? I loved it. Um, I, you know, I decided to get the rights when I was on the press tour for Zero Dark 30. Wow. And I think it, yeah, it was 2012. So, and that's when I got them. I think it was the exact opposite character. Interesting. I think it, you know, like one character is all about revenge yeah. and an eye for an eye. And Tammy, when I watched the documentary, and especially the Steve Peters interview, her, the way that she like forgiveness, what it means and that everyone is unconditionally loved. It was, whoa, there's no judgment. It felt like a healing balm. <laughs> and, and I didn't, I didn't know when I would play the part, but I was, but I knew that I would at some point. And so for this, you know, the seven years that I had, it was an absolute joy Mm -hmm. to read her books, to watch her interviews, to see her talking about a penis pump, to see, you know, all of this stuff. I laughed. I felt like, you know, she kind of like, yes, I, you know, I was doing other things too. And again, I'm not method. I'm not like, call me Tammy. Like, but she like grew inside of me. She said, we started as like little seed and every book I read, Every interview I watched, every song she sang, every time I talked to her kids, she like grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was, I was sad to, on the last day of filming. And every once in a while, I'll break into speaking like her. And, you know, just because, she, and without even realizing it, I'll just yeah. be like, oh, that sounded like Tammy. Um, because it's fun. And I love her. Did you know much about her prior to that documentary? Because I, I grew up with her, but I didn't really know her until I, you know, saw both the documentary and your movie. Yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I, I knew of her through SNL sketches, like, the, you know, the church lady, Dana Carvey, who I loved. And I had a huge crush on Dana Carvey. Um, so I, I remember that, like hearing of Tammy Faye. And then, of course, I think she was on the Drew Carey show. She was on the cover of magazines, but I did not grow up in a religious household. So it really didn't mean much to me. And it wasn't until I saw the documentary that I actually felt a bit bad because when I was a kid, she represented what you don't want to be as a woman, Mm -hmm. right? You don't want people to make fun of you because the way you look, you look garish, you are loud and, you know, like all of these things that people made fun of her for, I put in my head as a young girl, oh, I can't be that because then I'll get made fun of, right? Um, I won't fit in. And then when I watched the documentary and I saw her radical acts of love and her open hearted generosity to the people around her, I felt a bit shamed that um, I cared or I thought more about her mascara and her makeup than actually I, than knowing actually what she did. Yeah. Oh, it, it, th- there have been so many times, especially in like the last five years of my life, where I've realized I really, really misjudge things. And Tammy Faye was oh, yeah. one. Of them. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's the media, though, too. It's not like we're fed a story, right? We're fed 
our, our memories, we have to always like, I had a memory of mascara running down her face. I had that memory. And then the more I started doing research, I was like, there's no images or video of that. That memory was a character that was an SNL sketch that I have then thought that that was her. So we, it's almost like we have to deprogram the things that were fed to us mm -hmm. and really go, what is the truth of a situation? Not what have I been, what have I been fed? So aside from the documentary, um, and you were reading books, uh, it sounds <laughs> like you had a lot of time reading books. You're reading books about her, her, yeah, her story. Of course. Uh, sounds like you had a lot of time to sort of prepare to play her. Were you always sort of going back to Tammy when you could? Um, when I, I very rarely read a book for pleasure um, <laughs> you, because I love research. So usually when I'm reading something, it has to do with a project that I like or something that I'm interested in or something I'm thinking about making into a film. And so with Tammy, it's like, you know, you, when you go from reading The Looming Towers or the book on Osama bin Laden by Michael Schur, and then you're reading like Tammy's like, my life. <laughs> She's like talking about how she loves to take nail polish and color cubic zirconian jewelry to make rubies. And you're like, okay, I'm, this is so much fun reading all these things about her. It was an absolute joy. Mm -hmm. So if I would like, I'd finish Crimson Peak and I would be reading her books or I'd be watching her interviews. I would finish Most Violent Year or, you know, whatever I'd be working, Interstellar. And I was, she was constantly there um, as like, a, as the fun thing for me to, to research. Were you looking to make the movie back then or were you just sort of learning more and more? Like what, what finally brought it together? Well, after I got the rights, I started calling people because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a production company. I was just like, I just knew I want to tell her story because I think it's the right thing to do to tell it like this is actually who she was. And it also felt like, again, medicinal, like it would be healing some like, you know, of, of what I had just been working on. Um, and then I, but I didn't know how to produce or anything like that. So I called the first person I called was D David Greenbaum, who had just started Searchlight and we worked together on the debt and we're buds. And he said, I said, I got the rice. I don't know what to do. And he said, okay, well, let me know when you got a script. So then I called Rachel Shane, who I worked with on Lawless, um, who's a great producer. And she said, well, this is a great idea. Let's get a script together. So we started talking about writers and like, how are we going to, you know, approach the story. And through um, Rachel and Madison Wells, we got the script. Kelly Carmichael, my producing partner, came on. And then Searchlight and David Greenbaum, they were the only ones we sent the idea to. And they said, yeah. That's amazing. And then but it was a long journey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got the rights back in 2012? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. 10 years ago. <laughs> and I want to give a shout out to your amazing hair and makeup. I know. Uh, fellow nominated, Oscar nominated team. I know. Costumes. How oh, much amazing. did that help you find the character? Like stepping into those costumes and that hair and that makeup, even with all the research you've done, that has to be like the final piece. It's so important. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion of like, okay, when is makeup too much makeup? Or, you know, like all of that kind of like, you know, talk about this. I, we, I tested multiple times, like how to play her, where I did it without prosthetics. I thought, okay, you know, how do we do this? Because, you know, when she was in college, she was four, she was four feet, 11 inches tall. She was a little slip of a girl and she weighed 90 pounds in college. And then we go, years later in the 90s where she's completely tattooed her face and it's like she's a completely different person mm -hmm. so how do we like tell that story and then we tried it with just makeup and we said well that doesn't feel right to help us with the aging with everything that's going on and for me so much about who she was she presented in the world her appearance was so important to her it was like a protest for her you know, she, so much so she tattooed her face so people wouldn't change the way she looked, yeah. that it was important for me to try to look as much like she wanted to look as I could, as I physic as I could and as artists could help me. And I feel like by not doing that and not like allowing the skills of these geniuses to really shine um, during this process, it would have been a disservice to her because it was so important to her how she presented herself in the world. Um, and, and it helped me find the character. It just helped me find everything about her. 
you know, it, it, in addition to like, it's an obstacle because you've got a barrier between you and others and you're sensitive and you want to be open, but then you're like, well, what else can I use it's besides my old tricks? Like, well, I guess what I've normally used, I, I don't know. It's just like feeling the air or whatever. Okay. But how do I express now with my eyes? And now how do I like, okay, what, what gestures did she make? And what did, what are the things she did with her voice? And it kind of opened up a new way of performing for me because I felt constricted in one way. How much prosthetics in the end did you end up going with? Because I, I can't tell. <laughs> we, uh, what we were, cause we, the question was, do we start, we, do we only go prosthetics towards the end? You know, mm-hmm. when she's like radically different. And the problem with that is it, I didn't, it didn't look like the same human being, you know? So we always had something. We always, we started with cheeks. That was, that was the always thing. So we cheeks and then they would fill in. I have a dimple in my chin. So cheeks and a dimple. And then they put a piece of tape on my nose that just like lifted like, like to like that a little bit. Cause her nose kind of, you could see her nostrils a little bit. And then they put makeup on top of it. So that's was like the base look. And then from the, it went from there to different stages to finally, I was wearing a piece that was glued like on my chest, wow. my shoulders, my back. You know, I, Stephanie Ingram, who's the head of the hair department made wigs. She created wigs where I would be wearing at the end, you know, the very, very short wig. And then you'd put another wig on top of it. So when you take off one wig, you see that she has got short hair. It was so elaborate and specific what they did. Yeah. So yeah, it was always something. There was never just me. It was always the artist, the hair makeup artist and prosthetics artist being involved. I had no idea there were prosthetics involved. That's crazy. Really? I really, oh, wow. but, but I'm, I don't know if you remember this, but when I saw you in the heiress, uh, I went uh, backstage and you were like, hold on, let me take off my <laughs> nose. And I was like, you're wearing a nose. I didn't even know. <laughs> I'm clearly not the most observant person. <laughs> no, but that's, what's kind of amazing. That makes me so happy because that means you're like lost in the character. And also I learned for the heiress. Cause you know, this nose. They couldn't afford like someone to prosthetics to put a nose on me every day. I had, I learned it. They taught it to me. And so I have so much respect for what these artists do because I just had to do this one little thing where I'm like, you know, taking the latex and sealing it and doing all this stuff. But what they created with this movie is it's a skill that I don't understand. And I have the utmost respect for. How long did you have to spend in the makeup chair every day, but not, not just to get it all on. I'm curious about taking it off. (laughs) Well, it was the longest was seven and a half hours to put it on. And that was the nineties look. And that was a, that was a, like a panic moment of like, how do I act after sitting for so long? And they got that one down to like four and a half, four hours. Um, And then to take it off, it was never less than an hour, hour and a half, maybe. And they would, and you get to the point too, where you just like want to rip it off. (laughs) And so, but you have to be patient. So it's a lot of like deep breathing because you just want to like take it off, but it can, it'll take your skin off. So they were very quick, you know, especially the moments when you start to panic. Like if you get, I can be, I can get a little claustrophobic. So it's a lot of just like closing my eyes and breathing. And they're like, they're working as fast as they can. It's like you're on a NASCAR, you're the car. And then the whole team shows up and they're like (laughs) trying to get you out. (laughs) I just want to touch on uh, the rest of this cast because it's such an amazing ensemble. Um, Beginning with Andrew Garfield playing Jim Baker, who I don't think that like I would have seen that, but now I can't imagine anyone else in the role um obviously as a producer on the film as well was it your idea to cast him or you know were you looking at several people yeah no 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 I've always wanted to work with Andrew um I was shocked I was like I don't know that he'll do it I was and there were a lot of phone calls talking about you know I think he was afraid we might try to like the tabloidy version of it and I was like that is not we're not interested in that that's already been done multiple times this is, this is like re-examining um, these people. So that was a big uh, a thing to get him, but we work in a very similar way. He's an obsessive actor. He loves research. We would share research. We'd sit in the makeup trailer together, talk about videos um, and talk about the scene. We would improv together. Every Sunday we went to Heritage USA, you know, the, which is now Morningside Church. And we'd go to the service. It's where Jim and it's what Jim and Tammy built. So we really were, it was like a, I don't know 
what my performance would have been without him. I felt very, very like closely tied uh, to him. And we were great, great partners. Did the people at Heritage USA know who you were and why you were there? <laughs> no, but I was nervous because, you know, there's just like, this is also why I'm happy we made the film now. Because like the past six years has been so much negativity, you know, or like all these labels that people have. It's like red states and blue states and Hollywood elites or like people like, oh, you know, what what is the deplorables or, you know, like this is all of these labels that's been used in politics and it's been used uh, in terms of religion. It's, but it's always like, I'm better than so-and-so. And so we were, I was nervous. I was like uh, going into the church are people going to be like, what are you doing here? Are you know, are you going to make fun of us? Are you going to, um, you know, it's, I don't know. I was afraid. And I think, I think Andrew was too, because we were like, we didn't lie. You know, we weren't pretending going in disguise, but we're like, we're just going to go. And we, and we were very respectful to everyone. And immediately on the first day, he recognized someone from a, like a Dateline interview. Oh. And we went up, I know. And I was like, it was like a security guard. And I went up to him and I said, hi, I'm Jessica. And this is Andrew. And we're actually doing a movie about <laughs> Jim Baker and Tammy Faye. And we're, we recognize you. Can we talk? Can we talk to you? And he looked like upset. And he's like, follow me. Like, this is it. We're in trouble. So we go down this dark hallway. He brings us into this room. And Andrew and I are like, oh, gosh, we should have just been, kept our mouth shut, just sat in the corner and like just observed everyone and like felt, you know, what it meant to go to this beautiful like space and he's there and he's whispering with these other guys that are in the room and they're looking at us and I'm thinking oh this is not good and then all of a sudden he turns and he he stares at Andrew and he goes are you spider-man <laughs> <laughs> and both Andrew were like yes he's spider-man <laughs> <laughs> and we Honestly, we like sat with him for a long time. We sat with a bunch of people. We were there every week. And those folks at that church were the nicest people. They were so sweet. And the funny thing is like, we were afraid they were going to judge us. They were afraid we were going to judge them. And the reality is like, and that's kind of what Tammy, you know, face stood for. It's like, like, can't you just like love people without judging them? What if we're just like all human beings and we don't need to like be on any side? Uh, do you happen to know if they've seen the movie? I don't know. if I know our kids have. Um, I don't know if that very nice. I don't want to say his name, but because in case he doesn't want to be mentioned, but I don't know if he's seen it. But I know, um, you know, uh, Tammy Sue, her daughter sings the song in the closing credits. Uh, don't give up on the brink of a miracle. It's, you know, her mom's song and she, and she it's her beautiful version of it. And uh, J- uh, Jamie, Jamie Charles um is is a minister in his own right started his own church revolution church he officiates gay weddings wow yeah so uh and he was at the premiere steve peters was at the premiere the man who uh, tammy had the um interview with in 1985 the openly gay minister with aids and when no one was talking about aids she brought him on her show and she like said we need to put wrap our arms around them and tell them that we care it was a time of deep homophobia and fear in the united states and she really pushed against the jerry falwells and said no i'm going to do the right thing and that man was at our premiere steve peters so yeah it was it's been an exciting time i mean i had no idea how revolutionary she was and you know really really bucking against the system at a time where do you think she got that from I think it comes from being like the little kid that was, you know, she was born um, in one, you know, her, uh, a, a child of this marriage and then the father left mm-hmm. and it was a Pentecostal church, which is quite severe. They don't allow makeup, which that also, she was like such an inter. I'm like, Oh, she grew up in a church that like makeup was a sin. Okay. That, meant, that tells me a lot about her character right now. Um, and she, the mom got kicked out of, uh, the church because she remarried, you know, um, and she was a divorced woman. And then Tammy faces these the stepchildren. And the only reason the mom got back in was because she knew how to play the piano, <laughs> but Tammy was always like the embodiment of the shame, right? She was like always on the outside of it. And in reality, when she went into church for the, like one of the first times she started speaking in tongues. And I don't know if it's because God was speaking through her, 
I don't know if it's because for the first time, this little girl who had felt invisible all of a sudden felt seen and important and a miracle. But right at that moment, faith and love were joined. And I think it, God for her was love. Mm -hmm. And the way that she was radical, she wasn't like, I'm going to tear down walls. She's like, I'm going to build bridges and I'm going to love people. And those that feel left out or undeserving, I'm going to make them feel wanted and know that they're loved and they're important because she knew what it felt like to, to, to be the opposite and to be on the outside. That's where I think it all comes from. I, I think this was the first project you acquired as a producer, but I do want to touch on your producing work um, because obviously you had scenes from a marriage this year or sorry, mm -hmm. last year, we're in a new year. <laughs> we are. Oh my gosh. I keep forgetting. Um, I know you're working on George and Tammy. Yeah. Um, did you always want to be involved behind the scenes as well, or was it sort of a necessity? It became a necessity. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I never, I, I, someone told me, I guess I, in some sense, been producing without realizing it <laughs> because I've always been someone who's really interested in, first of all, casting and putting people together. Um, I've always um, talked, spoken to directors about this. Uh, a lot do I do a lot of script work. Scripts are really important to me. And so like development stage is super important. Um, I guess all of that I'd always been doing, but not realizing that in some sense, developing a project and putting the project together is producing. <laughs> um, so I have been interested in it, but this was the first one. I mean, Tammy Faye is the first thing I ever acquired. So I really had to, I learned a lot through this project. You've also worked with so many amazing directors. I mean, all my favorites, you work with Christopher Nolan on Interstellar, yeah. Guillermo del Toro on Crimson Peak, Ridley Scott on The Martian. Um, what is it you sort of hope for from a director when you show up for set? What's your ideal situation? I, I love a director who's a collaborator and has a point of view. I want nothing. I'm, I, I'm about to go work with, you know, Michelle Franco? Oh, yeah. He's amazing. Yeah, I'm going to go do uh, his next movie. Like no money, we're like creating it. You know, it's it's a beautiful script he's written. He's got a point of view, man. I I I like a strong point of view. I like someone who who's going to teach me things. Um, but I also like someone who doesn't want to treat me like a puppet. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes a lot with actresses, and I can get a little like <clears throat> I get a little upset about this because I find that it happens a lot of the time with unknown actresses when they they when a, a tour is making a movie, someone has a very strong point of view and there's a, a female part in there, they sometimes will put an unknown actress in that role because they're so malleable, yeah. right? And there's no back and forth. And I'm interested in, in auteurs and, and wonderful directors who are interested in collaboration with actresses as well as actors. Because we know, you know, most of the time they're very comfortable working with an actor who has a point of view. But I'm interested in working with a director who respects an actress's point of view as well. You've also worked from the beginning with a lot of female directors, it seems. Yeah. I don't yeah, it was important for me to, I had a thing like I was going to work with a female director every year. Um, and I started that early on. Wow. And you've done that? I don't know if I've done that every year, but I've worked with a lot yeah. of female directors. I mean, maybe I've worked with two female directors in one year or yeah. but I've worked with a, a ton of, of women and I hope to continue that. I mean, the industry now is very different than the industry was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would join a project <clears throat> because of a female director that I wanted to work with. And then as soon as I would join, and this was years ago, as soon as I joined, all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, this guy wants to direct it. and like. I'm like, no, 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 I signed on because of her. So it's it's wow. definitely a different, a different uh, industry. So you've done so many genres, so many different parts. Uh, what do you think has been your most challenging role for whatever reason? Well, I mean, I know that <clears throat> it's gonna sound not real because we're talking about it now, but definitely it's Sammy Faye. Yeah. <laughs> because of the amount of time to study her, uh, the voice is different. The singing, which is so stressful to do. I was not excited about singing, but now I've got something on Spotify. I literally am the artist of, of uh, Disco Jesus, <laughs> which no one, I never really on my bucket list, never imagined, but it's very cool. 
Um, no, everything about that project, putting it together, uh, the acting aspect of it. It was something that I thought like, oh, I'm really going to get made fun of. I'm going to get, you know, no one wants to see me in this way. This isn't something that I guess you would think is natural to me. Uh, the way she speaks, how she's like, welcome she knows people are gonna laugh at her and she does it anyway i'm the opposite of that so i really had to step out of my comfort zone um and i'm very exposed in this yeah. you know in the same way and maybe maybe my work is starting to change a little bit scenes from a marriage i'm quite exposed in as well i'm i'm in really really interested in doing things that most likely could fail wow. because it it, it means then that I'm, I'm pushing myself beyond anything I'm comfortable with. Wow. So uh, if someone's going to make fun of it, maybe it's probably a, a good thing for me to do. Which did you shoot first scenes from a marriage or Tammy Faye? Tammy Faye. We shot that before the um, pandemic. Yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. Um, and what can you tell us? What can we expect from George and Tammy? Because I am so excited for this <gasps> reunion with your take shelter co-star, Michael. Shannon. I know. I love him. So, I mean, we have 30 songs. It's uh, when we were working together on Take Shelter, I knew he's a great singer. He's got a band co called Corporal. Um, I put his, his uh, CD in the jukebox at the local jukebox in uh, Ohio that we were shooting Take Shelter in. I'd gone to see him in concerts. I knew he was a great singer. And I'd always thought like in the back of my head, he'd be, a you know, if, if it doesn't, however this goes, I, it would be great to work with him in a musical capacity. So we've been working on the music intensely, I guess, since March, you know, uh, remotely. And then October, it was every day, um, all day, working with a vocal coach from Nashville. And we were recording with T Bone Burnett, and now we're on set. And a couple of times, you know, like, her laugh is like, <laughs> like her laugh is so different than mine. But sometimes I've been talking to you and I'm realizing my voice is lower and I've got, I'm doing that laugh and I'm realizing, okay, she's there. Cause I literally was filming Tammy Wynette until 1am this morning. Uh, but so yeah, it's going to be, it's pretty, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful love story. And I'm really happy to do it with uh, Mike because he's so talented. I'm so excited to see it and get some more songs on Spotify. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Stand by your man. Who thought I, I would ever song. sing Stand by Your Man? <laughs> I love that song. I can't help okay, it. Okay, good. 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 <laughs> well, but you love it, but it would be amazing with you, like in your dog, too. Me and Chaplin, I'm happy to sing that song with Chaplin. <laughs> I sing to my dog, but I make up songs, which is just basically like, Wilbur, you're the best, <laughs> best dog ever. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. Yeah. He's just looking at me like, lady, you need a hobby. <laughs> well, again, congratulations on actually several beautiful performances in the last year. Thank you, I want to thank you so, so much for being here today and sharing your experiences and process with your fellow actors. Well, it's my it's my absolute joy. This is these are my favorite interviews to do. And it's because <clears throat> I remember always being at school or going to watch a talk or whatever. And like Phil Hoffman said this, you know, you always, you end up working with these people that give these talks. It always yeah. happens. And I've, I, and it's already happened to me on a set where someone said, Hey, I was at school when I saw you do, when you came back and you gave this little like 30 minute talk, it's already starting to happen. So I, I really love doing this because I remember what it was like when I was, you know, auditioning and feeling like, I don't know how to breakthrough and uh, you know I, I need some kind of encouragement and so I hope in, in some way that maybe like our conversation if someone's listening to this they'll feel encouraged because it's not it's not, I know it's not an easy journey but but if you stick on it and you um, and you keep the work and you still love the work it's like the best journey to be on. So they can come up to you on set and say, yes, I saw your conversation and in a they restaurant. Come up to you. Exactly. On set in a restaurant. If I'm with my kids, please don't take a picture of my kids. That's all I say. But other than that, come up to me. Give me a hug. Let's like talk. I, I'm really and I've always been like that. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you, Janelle.